Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse or barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do a small thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you O oh, you of little faith. And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy, Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Congregation may be seated.
Test? How about now? Okay. Dear Lord, please keep it working. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Sermon today comes from our gospel lesson, especially verses 28 to 32. Shouldn't I be worried? Well, shouldn't I? Shouldn't you? You ever have somebody come up and say to you, don't worry, everything will be fine. How well does that go over at times? Or don't worry because God will never give you more than you can handle. Sounds good. But actually, it's not exactly true. God does give you more than you can handle, but not without him. These things are easy to say, and it's easy for me to sit here and say, yeah, I shouldn't worry, but very, very hard to do at times in your life, isn't it? So what are we to make of these verses from Luke 12? Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, about your body, what you will, be, what you will put on. And verses 25 to 26, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Why am I? Yet I am. Anxious about a lot of things. Anxious when I was trying to write this sermon if I would actually get it done, to be honest with you. I have Jesus' promises in front of me, right? I know I shouldn't worry, right? Yet I do. When I was in high school, government class, it was the first test in government. And I had some friends that had taken this teacher before, and before that first test, they said, hey, there's this party. Let's go out to this party. And I'm like, no, I really need to study this. They said, look, you sat in class, right? You took notes, right? His tests are a breeze. They're multiple choice, and the answer is clear because the rest of those multiple choice answers just don't make sense. Okay. I went with him to the party. How'd I do for the test the next day? Bombed it. Should have been more worried about that, shouldn't I? So I was. I became more concerned, so concerned, and I was actually remembering this when I got to seminary and the first test I had in Greek. That was the summer when I arrived there. I studied. And I studied, and I studied, and I studied. The night before, I couldn't sleep, so I'm up in the middle of the night going through my Greek forms, words, and verbs. How do you think that did for me the next day? Bombed it. Everything might have been up there, but it was all jumbled up and mixed up. I couldn't sleep because I was anxious and worried about what I did. And that didn't serve me well either. Jesus brings up a good point here. Why do you worry when it can't add a single span to your life? In fact, we know the more we worry, what does it do to your life expectancy? Lessens it. Raised blood pressure, heart on your heart. Now, you guys worry about things, right? The thing is, though, I think many of us, most of us here, especially in this congregation, in this area, we don't worry about some of the things that Jesus says here. How many of you have worried about what you're going to eat later on today? You're not, are you? How many of you are worried about the clothes you're going to wear today or tomorrow? You're not, are you? Chances are you've got a refrigerator at home full of food, a pantry stocked with groceries, You've got a closet full of clothes. Yet we do have things to worry about. 
None of you are in school anymore, so you don't have to worry about tests. But there are exams that you can't study for that you're worried about. Health exams. Exams that the doctor gives you. Jesus here is using shorthand when he talks about food and clothing. Think back to uh, the Lord's Prayer. That petition in the Lord's Prayer that says, give us this day our daily bread. Luther pointed out, he's not just talking about bread. He's talking about everything we need in life. So some of those things, food and clothing, we don't worry about. But what about your home? The safety of your home? What about your 401k? Your stock portfolio? What about people stealing your identity? What about your health? What about your car? What about the chance that you could get in an accident? What about natural disasters, tornadoes, and thunderstorms, and lightning? What about your family? What about your children who don't go to church and may not believe? All of these things cause us worry and anxiety. They're all things that are out of our hand to control. And just reading this that we shouldn't worry, well, doesn't really cut it. It's about as effective as that song, which I absolutely hate, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Turn that thing off. How many of you are familiar with Bob Marley? Bob Marley had a song, Don't Worry About the Ting, Because Every Little Ting's Going to Be All Right. Once again, sounds good. He should have been more worried about the spot that was on his toe. He thought it was an old soccer injury. It was melanoma. And because he didn't do anything about it, because he wasn't worried about it, it would go on to take his life. Jesus is pointing us in a different direction. He's giving us the reason why we don't need to worry. We don't need to worry because we need to understand who we are as children of God and his kingdom. And so he brings up this point. Consider the ravens that they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are, they than, are you than birds? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you even Solomon in all his glory was not arraigned as one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Jesus isn't just randomly looking out at things around him in creation, although those things might have been evident. He's reminding us of a truth that we sometimes forget. Who God is to us. He is the creator. The loving creator. The thing that created the God that created every single thing that you see did it carefully six days so that we might understand how purposeful and how awesome it is that He created everything, not just the water, but the things that go in the water, not just the air, but the birds that fill the sky, not just the land, but the plants, trees, and animals, and the final thing, us. Adam and Eve. God didn't need to create any of these things. He was fine on his own. He created all this out of love. And he certainly loved every aspect of that creation. But what he really loves is you. The pinnacle of his creation. Man and woman. Adam and Eve. Created them last and said, this is all for you. My gift to you. Not to hoard, but to manage. To graciously manage with the same love that I give it to you. All is for your enjoyment and your pleasure, and it is forever. If that had been the reality forever, if we were living in that, you would have nothing to worry about. You wouldn't be anxious about a thing, but of course, things changed when Adam and Eve sinned. We changed. We could no longer trust in him like Adam and Eve could. 
And into the world came brokenness that causes us anxiety and worry. God still loves us. God didn't leave us to wallow in our sin and in our worry. He entered into creation itself to provide the answer. He says, fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's why Jesus came, to give you the kingdom, to give you the reign and rule of God, to restore it back into your heart. It was lost when Adam and Eve sinned. Christ came to restore you to that reality, to restore to you the fact that you can hold by faith that he is the loving, gracious God, that he does give good gifts, that he does care to take care of you. And the greatest example is the gift of his son who came to live the life we never could to be the manager of all God's gracious gifts that we are not, to use everything that he had in his hand not for himself but to provide love and the gospel to those around us, to those around him. And then to finally do and provide what we really need and that's to once again be good enough to be a part of this kingdom by giving his life on the cross. Taking all of our sins, all the things that would keep us out of the kingdom, all of those times we doubt and worry and dying for them, to remove them from our life forever and rising again so that we might know not only that we're forgiven, but that perfection that Adam and Eve had, that perfect creation that that will be restored on the last day. And for now, while we wait and we walk this earth, we do so not lost, not counting on ourselves to do and take care of these things that are clearly beyond us, but to know that he is with us, providing for us, a member of his kingdom. And how can we know that? By faith. The gift given in baptism that power that is planted into your heart. Something you don't have, but is given generously by God. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us, faith is the insurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The power to know that that, that death on the cross was for me, and that empty tomb, that's my future. Not because I've seen it, Not because I can scientifically prove it, but I know by faith because Jesus promised it. It's the ability planted in my heart from him to trust in what is beyond my ability to understand. Abraham had that. Abraham who had no kids and the Lord kept saying you're going to have one, he believed. Even though everybody else at that time and definitely now said, you ain't having kids. You and Sarah, 90 and 100 years old, it ain't happening. Abraham believed. And because he believed this promise of God, even when everyone else doubted, God considered him to be righteous by faith. The gift that God gave him to hold fast to that promise. And that faith was rewarded. By faith, Sarah herself received the power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him to be faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. They trusted in what God said. Sure, they received an example of that, that son that Sarah and Abraham held. But they held fast to the rest of this to all of those descendants that would come, and especially the promise that one descendant, one descendant who would be Jesus, would bless the entire world. They died without the realization of that promise, but they held fast to it by faith, just as you and I hold fast to when our last day comes on this earth, we will be with Jesus in heaven, according to his promise and the assurance that he gives us by faith. Jesus says, why do you worry? 
All the nations of the world, all the unbelievers worry, don't you know your Father knows everything you need? He does. And is willing to provide those things that you need. How many of you have had prayers answered? How many of you have been in need and God comes through? Maybe not in the way you thought he would, but in miraculous ways. Doing even those things that you never asked for. Those things you worried about but never lifted up in prayer, he answered them because he is the gracious and loving God who desires, who desires and loves for you to have what you need, to be happy, to be joyful. It may have seemed impossible for Abraham and Sarah to have children, but we're told nothing is impossible without God, right? Then why is it, why is it I don't get everything I need? Why is it there are some things that are not answered? Yes, God loves me. And yes, he desires to give me those things that I need, but what I see that I need and what he sees that I need are two separate things. Context is important here. Luke 137 was a promise given by the angel to the Virgin Mary. And it had to do with, well, the impossible thing was a child being born to a woman who had never known a man. It was a miraculous birth. Done not to make Harry, Mary happy, but done so that we could receive the gracious benefit, which would be Jesus Christ, true man and true God, our Savior. What about Isaac? Isaac was born in this line. Another miraculous birth, not by a virgin, but by a couple beyond the ability to conceive because from him would come that descendant who would bless the world. Isaac came not just to make Abraham and Sarah happy, but as a blessing for them and for you and for me, held by faith. Why does God do miraculous things in our life? Why does he answer our prayer? Why does he tell us not to worry? It's based on the kingdom, his kingdom, his reign and rule. What he does in your life and what he brings to you and the promises that he answered are based on this, not just your happiness. He will allow you to be unhappy. He will allow your prayers to go unfulfilled. What he wants is for you to be in that kingdom now by faith, his, his spirit reigning and ruling in you, and for you to stand in that faith on the last day. That's what he wants. He's given you the kingdom in baptism. And everything he does and allows in your life is so that kingdom, that reign and rule, that faith remains and grows. Because all the things we receive in this world, well, they'll perish one day. They don't last. But our love for him and our faith relationship, that's what lasts. And that's what he wants to carry through your life until the day when it's time for you to leave or he returns for us. Shouldn't I be worried? No. God does have it under control. Not according to what I want, but according to what he knows that I need. I read a story about one of the professors from seminary. He was never the kind of guy I would expect to do this, but I read that he had become a beekeeper. He had bees. Had them in his backyard. He talked about how having bees changed his life. It used to be his yard was all about aesthetics. He wanted to have the best backyard of all of his neighbors. And so the plants that he had and what he allowed to grow back there and what he didn't were all based on that. And then he got bees. And all of a sudden, what he allowed to grow in his backyard, the purpose changed. He said, when I would see clovers spring up in my grass, I would go get weed killer. But not anymore. The bees need those clovers. He would plant things in his backyard that would help the bees to pollinate and be successful. 
He reoriented his whole idea of what was the purpose of his backyard because of those bees, out of love and care that they thrive and grow. To quote Jesus, how much more God with you. He graciously gave you your life. Will he not give everything and anything that you need to sustain that life? Not just the earthly life, because that's going to end, but throughout that earthly life, keep alive that faith, that trust in him as the gracious and loving provider. You're going to worry. I'm going to worry. Because I don't understand always what it is I need according to his will and purpose, but at the end of the day, I can entrust whatever that is over to him, knowing that not only does he have my back, but he knows what is truly best for me now and unto eternal life. Don't worry about a ting, because every little ting and every big ting is going to be all right. Not because Bob Marley said it, but because Christ promises it. Because he's planted that faith and that trust in your heart. May that forever grow and flourish with you now until the day Christ calls you home. Amen. This would be the time... Oh, there we go. This would be the time in our uh, service when we would pass the offering plate, and we don't do that anymore here at Lamb of God. If you're visitors, we want you to know we're just thankful you to be here. We don't want you to feel obligated to give anything.